evening. <laughs> I am so excited to be here with all of you. Um, this light is really bright, so I can't see any of you. I know you're out there. So you can help me out by laughing at all the appropriate parts, OK? Um, all right, so we are going to get started here. That is if my clicker will work. OK, maybe it won't. That's not a problem. Oh, or maybe it is a problem. Let's see. This was my click. Oh, there we go. Woohoo! We got it. Awesome. Thank you, sir. All right. So, um, as Greg mentioned, uh, I am a science communication fellow with the Ocean Exploration Trust. My day job is right here in Santa Barbara at the Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, or Museum of Natural History. And uh, this actually was our cohort for last year. So these are the science communication fellows uh, and a couple extra people. And there you'll also see Dr. Ballard right there in the middle. Um, so my story actually starts with this guy's story. Um, so you are familiar with Dr. Ballard, I'm sure a little bit. Um, Dr. Ballard, uh, as you heard, was a gaucho. He actually studied here in uh, Santa Barbara, at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, he actually likes to say that he had to give all the wrong answers as an undergraduate student in order to get A's so that he could then go on to graduate school and come back and prove his professors wrong. <laughs> Part of the reason being that um, he really believed in this newfangled theory of uh, plate tectonics at that time, and that wasn't commonly accepted. So he actually is one of the scientists who, through his work, helped to prove plate tectonics as a viable theory. Um, so uh, he, at the time that he emerged from graduate school and started going out and really studying the oceans in great detail, um, had a dream with a lot of people uh, at his age of a wet NASA, of the government continuing to pour money into exploring the deep sea. And for a while they were, right? It was the Cold War. Um, so, you know, the government wanted to know where the bad guy subs might be hiding. They wanted to know where we could hide ours, among other things. And so there was a lot of money that was being poured into ocean research. Um, but over time, those funding streams kind of dried up. And so as a result, Dr. Ballard really had to go out there and hustle up his own funds in order to, to continue exploring. And after about 20, 25 years of this, said, you know, this is great, but I'm tired of having grant funding that makes me stay focused on something when I want to go study something else, or um, if I discover something great, like, say, hydrothermal vents, um, but you know somebody else's grant funding on the ship says, no, we need to go study this. We have to leave this really cool thing and go off and study that. And he said, I'm tired of this. If I want to steer to port, I want to steer to port. I want my own ship. So he did that. And actually, it's a really great story. This is the EV Nautilus. Um, turns out she was originally built in 1967 in Germany. And uh, she was up for auction back in the early turn of this century. And Ballard was competing for her at auction. And he lost. And he had his heart set on this ship. And so through his relentless charm and networking and never giving up, um, basically harassed the auction house <laughs> to find out, well, who was the winning bidder? And they were like, sir, we, of course we can't tell you that, and kept calling and calling and calling and calling. And finally they said, okay, we give. Um, here, we'll give you the agent of the person who won. And so then he was calling, 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 and they said, no, we, fine, I'm going to give you the assistant of the guy who won the ship. Calling, 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 relentless, and she goes, fine. You can meet with him tomorrow at 1 o'clock in New York City. And he said, all right, I'll be there. So he showed up, and it was a hedge fund billionaire who had actually won the ship. And uh, he laid out everything he wanted to do for the ship. And this guy looked at him and said, you know, I was going to convert it to a yacht, but you have a much better use for this ship than I do. I'm going to donate it. <laughs> so if you look at the website for Nautilus Live or for the Ocean Exploration Trust, and you see Florida Panthers, and you wonder, well, why? Is the Florida Panthers connected? What, where is that? That's the guy who donated the ship, also owns the Florida Panthers. Um, so fantastic story, and also a really good story that really highlights how Dr. Ballard just is that relentless 
drive and just does not give up. He's like a bulldog, right, once he gets his teeth into something. So this is, you know, the, the ship that's at the heart of all of it. She's 211 feet long. She can birth 48 people at once. 17 of those are crew members. The other 31 are members of the science team. So that includes um, all of the scientists, the ROV pilots, the navigators, the communicators, um, everybody who's going to you know, be uh, guiding that. Um, she goes out for about six to seven months a year. And the crew, or the science team, um, kind of rotates in throughout the season. So depending on your role, you may sail for a couple of weeks. You may sail for six months. It really depends, you know, because some of these particular roles, like ROV pilots, for example, you can imagine there's not a whole lot of those in the world, right? So these people tend to kind of uh, rotate in throughout the season. So uh, as Greg mentioned, I have done this for three years. I had a different version of a talk than I know a few of you in here have seen. Um, but after I sailed this past year in 2018, I realized I really need a new theme for my talk because they don't all fit under that old theme. So I went ahead and decided I was going to kind of tell the story of a day in the life. Because one of the most common questions that I get is, well, what's it like? What's it like day to day aboard this ship? So. We are going to start with waking up <laughs> in the bunk. And um, if you're claustrophobic, it's probably not the best career for you. Um, if you're lucky, you get put in a uh, cabin with two people. If you're not lucky, you get put in the quad cabin, which is in the way back part of the ship. It's got four people in it, which means you're guaranteed that somebody not on your watch uh, is going to be in your cabin with you, which means that you're going to probably have somebody sleeping in your cabin when you're trying to get up and get ready for your watch, or um, they're coming in as you're trying to sleep. So earplugs are a must on top of you know not being claustrophobic. So you're going to set your alarm, you're going to wake up, and you're going to really follow the schedule because uh, meal times are set. Meal times are pretty strict. If you don't show up in time, then maybe you're digging something out of the refrigerator. If you don't get your dishes into the galley in time, you're washing them yourself and then walking them back to the galley. Um, so we're going to start with breakfast. I'm right down there, 7.30 AM. I know I got to be ready to eat breakfast. Now, also, when you get up in the morning will also be dependent upon what your watch is. So uh, we sit four-hour watches. And uh, the beauty of that is that you always have fresh people who are on, right, every four hours. Um, I personally really dig this 8 to 12 slot, right, because you don't have to change your sleep schedule, right? I like that. I'm, I'm a person who likes their sleep, and I'm not getting the full eight hours as it is. So if I can not adjust my sleep schedule too much, I really like that 8 to 12. Um, 8 to 12 tends to be kind of the prime time. That tends to be where they put the watch leader, the science leader, and other stuff. So um, it's, it's really uh, a watch that's packed with a lot of rock stars on there. Not saying that I am, but just saying that the other people who are on that watch tend to be really knowledgeable, uh, tend to be really affable. And so that's a really fun watch to have. So after I get up, I'm going to first thing hit the head, right? Um, people are always very curious, what is the head like on a ship? Um, how do you go to the bathroom? Right? That's a very common question. Well, um, without going into detail, it's pretty similar. <laughs> um, so actually, they're pretty nice. Um, however, showers, probably not the best idea when the seas are somewhat rough, right? So there are days that we'll kind of go a few days without showers, just because the seas have been a little too rough to be soaping up while you're standing up. After you've cleaned up and done your business, you're going to unplug your device, which has been charging overnight. And since this ship was built in Germany, of course, then all the power is based on the European power. So uh, we've got adapters that we have to bring. There are some American plugs in different places aboard the ship, um, but not in the cabins. And while you've been sleeping, there's a good chance the ship has been mapping. Um, they like to do a lot of these uh, mapping runs overnight. And one thing that's very cool about the way that the EV Nautilus maps is it uses this multi-beam sonar system that basically is sweeping 
the sea floor with sonar. So you get really detailed maps. So this is actually a series of three maps that were put together um, of the Galapagos spreading zone, which is about 230 miles northeast of the Galapagos Islands. And you can see in great detail all these little ridges and all of those features that are down there. Blue is the deepest, red is the shallowest in your particular map. Now, mapping is really important because it can help you identify certain features that you want to go see. It can help you see other things that maybe you didn't even know were there. It also can help you to identify any hazards that might be there, right? Because you're sending down these multi-million dollar ROVs, you don't want to get hung up on anything. So having this real detailed map is really important. And very, very little of the seafloor has been studied in this kind of detail. I mean, we're talking 5 10%. Um, most of the seafloor mapping that we have was done with just the single beam sonar, just, you know, it, where it just gives you a little snapshot, right? This is much more detailed. So you're going to head up to the mess hall. Um, and the mess is beautiful, right? So you're looking at that ship that was built in 67 and looking at that cabin, which looks like, yeah, that was a European ship built in 67. Um, not so much in some of the social areas. So they've actually refinished a lot of the social areas, and they're beautiful. They have this gleaming woodwork. And uh, interesting in that the crew always takes this table here. Then there's three other tables, these two, and then there's one back over here that you can't see. Um, and every expedition is a little bit different. Um, the crew always kind of segregates themselves and always sits at that far table. Um, but so far as how people end up sitting at lunch or at dinner um, is always different. So on one expedition we found, or I found, that people really tended to segregate by age. Right? A lot of the younger people hung out together, a lot of the older people hung out together. Um, but the last time I sailed, there really wasn't any segregation. Everybody kind of, oops, mixed it up and sat together and sat in different places every time. So it's, it's interesting. You can go back, and it's a different experience, even though the setting is the same. Um, but it's very different each time. So right here uh, is where the galley is, back behind this rolling door. At 7.30, right, for breakfast, that door rolls up. Everybody gets in line. Everybody gets breakfast. We all start eating. There's also this tray here where we set out all kinds of food um, for people. Um, as I've entered the mess, one of the first things I've done is I've checked what we affectionately call the whiteboard of lies. Um, we call it that because it changes constantly. So they might fill something out and it may change by the middle of the day. It may change three times by the middle of the day. Um, so, so we definitely um, check that every day to see what's happening. At one point on my last expedition, and you'll see why in a few minutes, um, at one point our expedition leader went up and erased everything and just wrote a big question mark. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it goes. So when the food gets set out, like I said, we all get in line, we all grub, and one of the things that everybody asks is, well, how is the food? It's excellent. It's really, really good. And uh, I think that's because they realize that the way to keep morale up is to feed people well. And the food is fresh, it's delicious. Um, the crew is largely Ukrainian, um, so we get some really interesting dishes. And in fact, um, I discovered, much to my chagrin one time, um, that they're fond of liver. And I didn't know that that's what I was eating because I was just being adventurous. I wasn't able to finish that particular plate. But um, I've definitely tried some new things aboard this ship. So while everybody's eating, one thing that's been happening is if we're getting ready for a dive, our ROV team has been out there busily preparing the ROVs for the dive. It's important to note that we don't send people down to explore the deep sea aboard this particular ship. There's a few reasons for that. Um, if you think about it, let's say if a human could endure, say, an eight-hour expedition or an eight-hour dive. Well, if you spend an hour and a half to two hours descending, to the sea floor, and then you have to leave yourself that much time to ascend and go back up to the surface, that means that you may only get three or four hours of bottom time, truly. And really, if you have a ship that costs 30 grand a day to run, how inefficient, right? I mean, that just seems like a real waste of time and resources. 
And also, you know, robots don't need bathroom breaks. They don't need to take a meal. They don't have OSHA, right, breathing down your neck over them. Um, so uh, it's safer, it's more efficient, you can get a lot more done. So the ROV team, well, um, you know, we're getting ready, getting things going. They've been prepping, they have run all sorts of different tests on the ROVs, check all of the systems, make everything, make sure everything's working and prepared. The very last step is actually not written into the manual. And the very last step is right here, and it is oiling the tiki. And so as you know, sailors can be a superstitious lot of people. And so on one of the Titanic explorations, it wasn't the expedition, um, but on one of them, they were having relentless trouble with the ROVs, just one little problem after another and after another. And eventually the bosun took a piece of driftwood and carved this tiki and mounted it to the ROV. And they didn't have any more problems. <laughs> and so now this tiki has been mounted on the ROVs, affiliated with the program ever since. And the unwritten step that must happen is that the tiki gets oiled as kind of a blessing before the, uh, the dive. And I kid you not, I have been on board the ship where they've forgotten to do the step and something has gone wrong. So, so there you go. Um, so once everything's been checked, the tiki has been oiled, then we start the dive. So first thing, and it's really exciting, right? Everybody, you know, the energy on the ship completely changes when we're getting ready to dive. Uh, you can't go down on this back deck unless you're part of this team, right, um, at that point. And so everybody goes over to the upper decks to watch the launch. And they use this crane to then swing Hercules, ROV Hercules, out over the side of the ship, drop Hercules into the water. Once Hercules is free, then they follow up with the second ROV, which is Argus. So Argus is also affectionately called by Dr. Ballard the dope on the rope because it doesn't do a whole lot. It can move in just a couple of different directions. Um, it has lights and a high definition camera. Um, this frame is all titanium, very, very heavy and dense. The second ROV, Hercules, is much more nimble and much more useful in a lot of ways. So like Argus, Hercules also has high definition cameras and lights, um, but Hercules has a pair of arms this one, the craft predator arm has, I believe, 17 different joints in it, so it can move in all sorts of different directions. Very, very nimble, um, can pick up really massive things or really tiny, delicate things. So I actually watched one of our ROV pilots pick up really, really delicate bivalves from the seafloor near Catalina and then place them into the bio box. And when those came up to the surface and humans were handling those for the first time, they actually crushed some of them accidentally with their hands. So really fantastic that she was able to take this manipulator hand on the, the ROV that has a crushing force of like 6,000 pounds per square inch and yet was able to very delicately pick those up and transfer them. The other arm, not so delicate, and his name reflects it, is called Mongo, as in Mongo Smash. Um, Mongo's used for picking up really heavy things or you know, deploying heavy equipment. Um, there's also a set, you can't see here, of, of boxes and drawers kind of lining the bottom of the ROV where we can tuck in things like biological samples, geological samples, and down underneath the water, uh, along what we call the front porch, there's a slurp gun, which is just basically like the hose you would have on your vacuum. And we use that to actually suction up sediments or soft animals like um, jellyfish and things like that. Along the sides, we have um, devices for sampling sediments. And then on the other side, we have devices for sampling water. And all the time, new technology is being tried out, being strapped onto these, and being tested. So I've been on board uh, several times where they've been trying out different new technology with the aim of, say, being able to pick up things really delicate or being able to sniff out different chemicals in the sea, like if you were looking for a hydrothermal vent or something like that. Um, so again, they're constantly trying to push those boundaries of ocean exploration. Now, here's the really cool part. 
So you may wonder, well, why do you have two ROVs, especially if one is the dope on the rope? What's the point, right? Well, if you can imagine, if you've got the ship at the surface and it's rocking and rolling, and now you've got an ROV tied to that, can you imagine looking at the camera view? Right? You'd be said, uh, sharing uh, seasickness all around the world. Right? So not the best plan. Um, so what happens is, is that we've got the ship, and we've got Argus, real heavy, taking all that motion from the ship. And that leaves Hercules down below to move around without being kind of jerked up and down by all that motion of the ship. Now, something else that's very cool is they are connected to the ship via this cable, which has a fiber optic cable inside. And so everything that these guys are seeing, and notice I call them guys because we're very fond of them. They're, you know, kind of like, they're, they're human to us in a lot of ways. Um, so everything that they see gets transmitted up through this cable up to the ship and then out via the satellite uh, dome that's on board the ship up to a dedicated satellite that they rent for six months a year. It's out there in, in the outer space. And uh, then out to the University of Rhode Island. And then from there, out to the internet. So guys, guess what? It starts tomorrow. <laughs> so um, I'm going to say two things as I introduce you to this website. First of all, I'm gonna say you're welcome. And secondly, I'm gonna say I'm sorry, because it's really addictive. Um, so when the ship is exploring, you can actually go on to this website. It's nautiluslive.org. Nautilus like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Dr. Ballard's favorite book growing up as a kid. Um, and you can see what's going on live. You can switch between different views. So there's the Hercules view, there's the Argus view, and then the quad view usually has a couple extra screens in there. Maybe a map, maybe it has a view of the control van. I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, so you can toggle between these, and here's the really cool part. You can send in questions. Right? So you get to interact with the people who are exploring. And my job as a science communication fellow was to sit at the terminal where all of those questions are coming in and to work those into the conversation of the people conducting the dive. So as you go to this website and you hear everybody talking, you're, you're hearing the people who are actually conducting the dive. You send in a question, and if it's a good question, um, then people are going to end up talking about it, maybe give you a little shout out. So again, nautiluslive.org, tomorrow the season starts. So good timing on this one. Now other things you can learn, if you are interested, I'm assuming because you're here, you're probably a little interested in the ocean. Um, you probably know people who are interested as well. Uh, you can learn about the people who are part of the team, um, particularly if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I go do something like this, or if you've got you know, a kid or a grandkid or somebody that you know that's really interested in, and is interested in this kind of a career path, how did they get there? So there's all of these different great biographies and stories of all the people who are part of the core of exploration. You can also go and see photos and videos of past expeditions, and guys, this is awesome because scientists geek out over stuff, same as we do. Right? So it's so fun to hear these scientists who you think, oh, they know this, and to hear them totally geek out when they see something cool, because we do. Um, so definitely go check out these photos and videos. Uh, you can also learn more about the science behind deep sea exploration. How does this work? What are the tools that we use? And you can learn about the expedition itself. So uh, this year's expedition going out further into the Pacific Ocean than the Nautilus has ever gone. Um, so some really exciting stuff is going to be going. So I encourage you to go check out that website. Okay, so vehicles are in the water. I'm on watch. I'm on the 8 to 12 watch. I slide into my seat. I log into everything. And I'm sitting right here. As I said, I'm at the terminal that's getting all those questions that are coming in from the internet, from people all around the world. Next to me is the video engineer. Com completing the front row are our two ROV pilots and our navigator. Our navigator's role is to actually coordinate the movements of the ship and the ROVs. So if you think of the ROV kind of like you're taking your dog for a walk, you know, and your dog gets real eager and stretches that leash, 
we don't want to be doing that, right? That's a really expensive, very delicate leash. So we really have to be careful that we keep the ships and the, the ship and the ROVs in the right position. And so this navigator works with the bridge to make sure that the ship is moving, staying, and can move over as little as a meter, you know, because we have thrusters that actually help to position the ship. In the back row is our science team. So our uh, science leader who's gonna make all of those calls, you know, do we pick that up? Do we take that with us? Do we keep moving? Do we go check out that anomaly on the sonar? What do we do? That's the person here who's making all those calls. And then this table tends to be open unless Dr. Ballard's sailing with us and then that's where he tends to hang out. So this photo is from my very first watch on my very first expedition. Uh, we were actually in the Galapagos, and we were studying the uh, Galapagos Spreading Center where Dr. Ballard first found hydrothermal vents in 1977. And it was his first time going back there in 38 years. So this is the arm of the video engineer. Here's my two ROV pilots. There's the navigator, and there's Dr. Ballard just hanging right over the shoulders of the ROV pilots. Now here's the thing. We were saying, Bob, Bob. Sit down. It's going to be a long dive. Sit down. It's OK. We're not even to the bottom yet. Look at this. We're in blue water still. We're still descending. And he's just like a kid in a candy store. I can't. I'm so excited. So um, he is absolutely amazing to be on the ship with, nonstop energy. Um, at one point on one of these dives, um, he kept yawning. And what's really interesting, you thought yawns were contagious? They're contagious over the internet. We had people writing in from other continents going, Ballard's making me yawn, tell him to stop. So really interesting. I just... um, and while we are in the control van, we all have headsets on. And so we're all talking to each other. And we use this system to communicate with each other. So in order, um, from left to right, you've got the bridge, the science party line, which is basically what we're all talking on, uh, video, the two uh, ROVs, Argus and Hercules, the data, science, science two, those are all in the back row, the chart table, which I pointed out. Then we've got the data lab and the lounge, so that you, actually other places on the ship can call into us too. So we can all talk on the science party line, or if, say, the ROV pilot needs to talk to the navigator real quick, they can click out of SPL and just talk to each other and then they can jump back in. So it's a really cool system that we're able to have these communications because that control van is dark. There's a wall behind me, so I can't see the science team behind me, but I can hear them in my head. And it's really loud because there's lots of fans and other things kind of worrying in there. So having those headsets really allows you to uh, communicate with each other. So as I mentioned, the first year that I sailed, I got to sail near the Galapagos Islands. We explored the Galapagos Rift Zone, or the Spreading Center, about 230 miles northeast of the Galapagos. And all of our dives were between 2,400 and 2,500 meters. So again, remember meter multiplied by about three to figure out how many feet that is. So 78 to about 8,200. People always go, what'd you see? Oh my gosh, hydrothermal vents, what'd you see? We saw lava. We saw a lot and a lot of lava. We saw lava piled up in weird shapes. We saw lava piled in pillow lava. We saw tons of lava. And in fact, on that first dive, um, when you know Ballard was so excited, we got to the bottom and we were expecting to see these really vibrant um, hydrothermal vents that had just been studied within the past couple of years and it was all lava. It had all been paved over. And so, you know, in the back row, on the chart table, they're pulling out scientific papers and charts, and they're going, are you sure we're in the right place? Are you positive? Well, but this paper described this and this and that. No, we're in the right place. And so we kind of hunted around that first dive, and so here we had this great excitement, and then really tempered into this, not quite disappointment, but just, oh, Okay, well, it just shows us that the ocean is really dynamic and it's always changing. Um, and, you know, we came to appreciate lava in a different way. So, yeah, us biologists were like, hmm, okay. <laughs> the geologists were stoked. Uh, but this is actually kind of interesting because this was a lava flow that came downhill, and you can see how it piled up 
kind of like a rug that's been tripped over. And this is a sea cucumber. And no, I have not changed that color. That's its real color. Now, this was a moment that, for me, was a goosebumps moment. Now, as you're looking at this, you may go, wow, you have a really low bar. <laughs> um, but let me explain why. This right here is the Nazca plate. This is the Cocos plate. So right here is the boundary between new two plates, all new earth being made. And when, every time I look at this photo, I hear Dr. Ballard in my head saying, we're at the boundary of creation, folks. We're at the boundary of creation. And so, yeah, so like I'm getting goosebumps now thinking about it. Like, how cool is that? Like here in California, we're lucky, right? We can go see the San Andreas. We can drive out into the desert and we can see it and go, wow, there's a plate boundary. That's cool. Um, but to actually get to see it like that underwater was just fantastic. Now, this is one of those videos when you go to Nautilus Live, you get to hear the scientists geek out. This is called a flamboyant squid worm. And when we found it, the scientists, you can hear them on the video going, what? is that? Is that something eating that something else or what? And it turns out that this was a species that had never been seen near the Galapagos. In fact, it had only been discovered a couple of, couple of years previous at some hydrothermal vents near the Philippines. So it wasn't a completely new species, but it was a new sighting in this particular location. Really interesting and bizarre creature. And it used all these little appendages on the side to kind of swim through the water. I would, I would, oh, very small. This is a pretty small animal. Um, so I would have more photos, but I've got three years to cover. So I've got, I've got more stuff. I'll come back to it. OK, so my watch has ended, 8 to 12. Now I'm going to go up for lunch. And again, people wanting to know, well, how is lunch? You can see it's really good. Um, funny thing, I ate um, so much pineapple on my last expedition because the ship had just come from Hawaii. And they ordered 15 pineapples before they left. And there was a little glitch. And they got 15 cases of pineapples. <laughs> so I had pineapples with every single meal for two weeks. And I don't know that we even made a dent in the pineapple population in the hold. Um, but you, know, you could easily be a vegetarian aboard the ship. Or you could easily be a carnivore aboard the ship. Either way, there's a great food. And they feed you really well. Now, you might fix up your plate. And you might decide, I'm going to sit outside. So there's this really lovely social deck right outside. So the mess is just inside these doors. Beautiful tables here. Again, that beautiful gleaming woodwork. You can come outside, get some fresh air. So then once I've gotten my dishes back in in time before the galley door closes, right, so I don't have to wash them myself, then I'm going to go check in because one of the other jobs as a science communication fellow that we need to do is we do live interactions. And we do live interactions with venues all around the world. So earlier I was talking with a gentleman who said he got to go to the Titanic Museum in Belfast. That was one of the venues that we've done regular interactions with. For example, Long Beach Aquarium of the Pacific. We've done some with my museum and Sea Center. Um, and schools and places all over the world. And so we just have these real quick interactions. So again, if you're connected to a venue or even a classroom um, that would be interested, they can actually sign up and have these live interactions with those places. So you can ask me about that as well. Now those live interactions are done from the very glamorous studio aboard the ship. No, it's not so glamorous. But there I am getting ready for my interaction. We actually just do it right through the computer, um, through a Google app that we're able to actually hook up with people. And this is what it looks like from their perspective. Um, so this shot was actually taken at the Sea Center when I did a live interaction with the Sea Center last October for one of our festivals. OK, so now I've done my live interactions. I've got a little bit of time. Um, at this point, people will go do different things, depending on what their role aboard the ship. But as you can imagine, a 211-foot ship, you don't get a lot of exercise. And you're getting fed a lot. So you might decide to go to the gym. Now, the gym is actually pretty nice. Um, it's got a uh, treadmill right here. It's folded up. It's got an elliptical. It's got a weight machine, some space to you know, do Pilates or yoga or whatever. Uh, it's also got a row machine. And I got to tell you, rowing while you're at sea is an entirely different experience. 
It's really cool, because you actually do get to see the water through the porthole, um, but as the ship is rocking and rolling, right, sometimes it's great, and then other times, who you're really working hard, right, depending on if it's working for you or against you, um, but absolutely fantastic. Um, and it feels so good to just get a little bit of exercise, because you're really not getting a whole lot other than going up and down between decks. Um, that, that's something, you definitely get a lot, of, a lot of floors. You don't get a lot of steps every day, but you get a lot of floors because you're climbing those stairs in between. Okay, so after I've done that, maybe I go take a shower and then I can go check in on how the dive is going in the lounge. So this is another area on that social deck level, um, again with the same beautiful gleaming woodwork. Um, there's a trio of large monitors that show you whatever the ROVs are seeing. And you can just sit on these nice big couches. Everybody hangs out there. And you can watch what's going on. You can even you know, call down um, to the control van, or actually you'd be calling up to the control van uh, if you needed to chat with them real quick. So this was amazing. As you can imagine, 2015, it was absolutely life-changing for me and such an incredible opportunity. I applied to go back in 2016 and thankfully got to explore right here in our backyard. So I got on the ship in San Diego, got off in San Pedro. And uh, we explored the ridges and basins out here just off Southern California. Now, you may not know this, but here in Santa Barbara, millions and millions of years ago, we actually would have been neighbors to San Diego, right? They actually were aligned, and then over time, that land split and twisted and moved, and what we ended up getting was this network of ridges and basins. It's really interesting, because normally off of a continent, you get this long, broad, flat continental shelf, lots and lots of mud. Um, but our, our bath, bath imagery right, is very different than it is in a lot of places. You can see we got a lot more variation in our dives too, right? So where we were at 2,400, 2,500 meters um, for all of the Galapagos dives, you can see we had as little as 890 meters and as much as 3,300, right? So um, big, big variety on these different dives. And people always want to say, well, what did you see? What's out there? What's in our backyard? Mud. Lots and lots of mud. And then you would be peering, and you'd be looking, and you kind of see something looming up out of the darkness, and you'd go, oh, rock! You'd get really excited, because the rocks is where all the life is, or most of the life. Um, so all of a sudden, you come across a rock, and you go, oh, wow, slow down, slow down, let's get a look. And you know, in one little small section of rock, you, know, you might see brittle stars, if you're lucky, you might see an octopus. Half the time when we see an octopus, we're kind of going by and someone goes, octopus! And everyone goes, aww, because we've already passed it. <laughs> and there's just no, like, there's no stopping. You just kind of keep going. Um, but different kinds of anemones, all sorts of different things, all clustered on that one rock, on that hard substrate. And here's another example. So you've got these tall vase sponges, these pom-pom anemones, different kind of anemone in here. You've got these little squat lobsters or these little crabs in here. So again, in one area, all of a sudden you get a lot of diversity all clustered together. A lot of the fish in the deep sea have this same kind of sinuous eel-like body structure. Um, they tend to move very slowly. Um, and there are some things that are very similar about them, and then there are some things that are very different. So you'll notice, for example, this guy here, very, very tiny eyes. Tells you he probably does not rely upon vision, right, for finding prey and other things. Um, which would make sense, right, because they're living in a permanent midnight zone, right? There's no light down there. Um, pretty much the only light that they might see is probably coming from bioluminescence, from animals actually making light. Um, this guy, though, different story. Look at how large those eyes are compared to the rest of its head, right? So this animal is obviously very sensitive to light and using it for different ways. Now, many of them have other sensory features that, you know, we don't have. So fish have along their body a lateral line system that can actually help them to detect changes in the water pressure. Um, so if you've ever watched a school of fish all move in unison and wonder, how do they do that? That lateral line system is the key to that. Uh, additionally, if you check out this fish here, you see he has little barbels underneath his chin, kind of like a catfish, helpful in finding prey, 
right? You're rooting around in the soft sediments to try and find some prey. Now this animal, when we saw it, I started laughing because it reminded me of a potato that had sat in the back of my pantry for a little too long. <laughs> um, this is actually a sea cucumber. And sea cucumbers have a really interesting way of feeding, or this particular type of sea cucumber does, where they actually take these filamentous appendages and stick them out into the current. And then as stuff floats by, whether it's plankton or detritus, detritus is basically a fancy name for just organic junk, right? So it could be like dead and decaying bits of, you know, animals or plants, poop, you know, other stuff like that. So this guy just sticks those tendrils out into the water and as stuff floats by, it gets stuck and then once they get it full, it pulls it in and licks it clean and sticks it right back out. So it's a pretty elaborate form of uh, filter feeding. Okay, this was one of my favorite animals from 2016. We saw a lot of these. Does anybody know what this is? It's a hagfish. Oh, so if anybody has um, eel skin shoes or belts or bags, it's probably actually hagfish. It's probably not eel skin at all um, because they can actually farm these pretty easily. Um, hagfish are these delightfully horrible creatures in the deep sea. They're ubiquitous. They're a jawless fish and they don't have a proper backbone. Right? So even though it's technically a vertebrate, it doesn't have a proper backbone. Now that's useful because it can actually tie itself into a knot. And you may wonder, well, why in the world would something want to tie itself into a knot? Um, there's a couple of reasons why. One, you can imagine it's a lot harder to swallow something that's tied itself into a knot and is now this big lump of something. Um, but the second reason has something to do with its food. So remember I said, when you're in the deep sea, what do you see a lot of? Mud, right? A lot of mud. There's not a whole lot of food down there. So when something does die and settle all the way down to the bottom, it's like, you know, Christmas and Hanukkah and every birthday you've ever had all rolled into one for all these animals at the bottom of the sea. Because they're like, woohoo, we get to eat. And so everything flocks to this, you know, carcass at the bottom of the ocean. Um, and so how would this jawless fish take advantage of that resource? I mean, how do you do that? If you've ever watched a snake feed, right? You go, oh, that's amazing. How does that happen? Well, same thing for these guys. How in the world is an animal like that supposed to eat a whale carcass, right? So what they do is they'll actually sink their face right into that whale carcass. I know, I'm sorry, some of you probably just ate. Um, and then it will tie itself into a knot and then pull itself out backwards through the knot using it as leverage to rip a big mouthful off of that carcass. And so that's a really helpful um, adaptation that they have. Well, there's another really interesting adaptation that they have. And they ha can produce this slime. And it's instantaneous. So if something comes along, right, because, you know, there's not a whole lot down in the deep sea, right? So you got to have all of these different ways to, you know, fend off predators. Um, so they can produce this slime. Boom! They're surrounded by this slime. And it's horrible. Um, Scientists, though, really like to look at nature and figure out, well, if nature already engineered this thing, how can we reverse engineer this and then apply this in these other fields, right? So we see that all the time with different scientific uh, advancements. So I would like to encourage you, not right now, but sometime if you want to have a laugh, Google the words hagfish car accident. So scientists who were studying these animals had a bunch of them in five-gallon buckets and were transporting them. And there was a little fender bender. And remember I said they produce that slime instantly, especially when they feel threatened? Well, you Google hagfish car accident. And there are so many awesome photos of just the highway covered with slime and hagfish and all sorts of things. Now, of course, we laughed and joked about hagfish and slime quite a bit aboard my, uh, my 2016 journey. And at one point, someone had told this story about the slime, and they go, no, 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 it gets better. So also in the slime is this toxic substance. Because again, you know, whale, woohoo, all right, you know, I get to eat. Um, but now you don't want other people eating your dead whale carcass, right? So they actually have this toxic substance in their slime that makes it poisonous 
to anybody else who tries to feed off that carcass, right? Except for other hagfish. So the first time someone told this story, I kind of start laughing, like quietly and then harder to myself. And they're going, okay, give it up. Why are you laughing? I said, well, it reminds me of my Uncle Jeff. Long pause, and they go, okay. Would you like to explain? I said, well, when my cousins were teenagers and they were eating my aunt and uncle out of house and home, my Uncle Jeff would pull his favorite things out of the refrigerator and go into the living room in front of my cousins and lick them and say, I lick this, don't eat it, and put it back in the refrigerator. So kind of seemed like that was the same strategy that the hagfish were using. Now I have to throw in some cephalopods, um, gratuitous cephalopods. Everybody loves them. Everybody goes crazy when we find them, especially if they're really cute and they have big eyes. They're also my favorite animal, so I get real excited whenever we see them. And I'll tell you, the internet loses its mind when we find a Dumbo octopus. Now these, these guys get their names because they have these really cute little flaps, just like Dumbo, and they just kind of flap them as they move through the water. Um, they're actually fairly common in the deep sea, but because we're so rarely in the deep sea, encounters with them are rare for us. Um, so, uh, yeah, people just completely go bonkers when we find these. But I'll tell you what really made everyone go bonkers. Do you remember this from a couple years ago? Yeah. So this is a uh, stubby squid, and this was found at about 3.50 a.m. So I had gone off watch at midnight. And this was found uh, in the last 10 minutes of the next watch. Again, there's really great um, video. And you can hear the scientists completely lose their minds on this one. You can hear them debate, well, what is that? Is that an octopus? Is it a squid? No, it's a cuttlefish. No, I think it's a cuttlefish. No, I think it's a squid. No, I think. And so you can hear them debating this. And then um, when I came on watch, so then there was another watch. When I came on watch, the gal who had been on watch from 4 to 8, said, yeah, I guess they found something purple, and it was cute, and it had big eyes. I don't know. I'm going to bed. <laughs> and so then, of course, I sit down, and I start Googling. I'm like, what's going on? Because our numbers were like going like this. So that's another benefit of where I sit. I have access to our social media feeds. I can see who's you know, interacting with the Nautilus social media, and I also have access to see who's tuning in and from where. And so I just watched our numbers, our viewership numbers going up, 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 and watching Twitter just explode with this and everybody talking about it. And so to be part of this as it was going viral and to watch it go viral was absolutely fascinating. Turns out that these guys are very rarely um, seen because they usually cover themselves with this mucus net where they actually um, then will cover it with sediment. And so the fact that it was naked was like entirely rare and unique. And for us to see it, people thought it was fake. They thought it was a dog toy that we had actually put down there. I mean, look at those googly eyes, right? Um, so the fact that they saw it at all was amazing. And, and that's how I like to think about ocean exploration, right? People say, well, you know, what's it like down there? Well, you know, it's kind of crazy because if you can imagine going into your backyard with a drinking straw, right, and looking through a drinking straw at your backyard and then someone saying, What's life on the surface of the earth like, based on just what you've seen from your drinking straw? Right? That's kind of ridiculous. But that's a lot like what ocean exploration is, right? Because we've just got this narrow little puddle of light that we can see. And I actually, I swear, have heard Ballard say, we could go right by a UFO and we'd never know it. <laughs> he has given us permission to wake him up any time of the night if we come across a UFO, by the way. Um, so back to our friend, the stubby squid. So I got home, and watching this go viral was amazing. I got home, and I kid you not, two weeks later on Etsy, somebody was selling socks <laughs> with a stubby squid. And then last year, I was updating my talk, and I went, oh, I need to get that picture of the socks from Etsy. And so I Googled it, and guess what? You can also get leggings, t-shirts, sweatshirts, even a pin, a mug, and a knitting pattern, if you're so inclined, inspired by the stubby squid. And so again, it's so cool to see how engaged the world gets in this and how excited, because I think it's cool, right? But of course, I want to see that other people think this is cool too. 
Um, so then start the memes, right? And all the memes start <laughs> popping up, you know, through Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, right? So our stubby squid. And then a couple of years after our expedition, one of our navigators is from Spain, and he sends an email around to our group. You guys, he's on a music festival poster in Spain. <laughs> no connection. But again, how cool is that? Right, that people around the world saw this thing, and for whatever reason, it resonated with them. Right? And so that's one thing that I just love about this, is that the science is cool, getting out there and exploring and seeing things that have, human eyes have never seen before. That's cool. But the coolest part are the connections, um, that really seeing the human connection and how engaged people get with this program. OK, so. Whew. We've gotten some good stuff here. We've got some more exploring. Well, one of the key things that we need to do is we got lots of data. We get lots of video. We get lots of photos. We get lots of mapping data. If there's other scientific experiments going on, lots and lots of data to be worked through. So this is actually the data lab, one of the few places aboard the ship that have American-style plugs, by the way. So if you forgot to bring your adapter, you're spending a lot of time in there charging your phone and other devices. And then if you've got rough seas, you're very thankful in the data lab that the chairs do not have wheels. Notice, they're smart. And uh, in the mess on our last journey, weather got kind of rough. We actually had to tie together all the chairs in the mess because they became projectiles. It was, uh, it was actually got a little scary there for a while. Okay, so now if you've been aboard the ship for a while, uh, chances are, you might be smelling kind of ripe, especially if you've, you know, uh, skipped a couple of showers here or there, been to the gym. So thank goodness. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention, you only get to bring two bags with you, two carry-on bags. You don't get to check your luggage when you fly to meet the ship because if your bags get lost, the ship's not waiting for you. So you get two carry-on bags. Now, if you're going out for two, three, four weeks, how do you bring everything you need in two carry-on bags? Well, the answer is, there's laundry aboard the ship. Um, the downside, they were all bought in Europe, so they're not in English. <laughs> so figuring out how to do your laundry on these machines is kind of interesting. I'm not sure where they're from, I think Turkey. Um, so yeah, so that's always an adventure. You gotta get someone who's been aboard to kind of show you how to work them. And you feel like a 12-year-old again, learning how to do laundry. Okay, so now it's dinner time. And dinner is excellent. And after you've had your dinner, you rush and you jump up to go get back in the control van because you're so excited to continue the dive. Now, here's the thing, right? If you had people in a submersible, they would already be coming back up and they'd be done for the day. But since we're just switching people out every four hours up top and the robots are down, they can stay down for three days. Right? That's the longest that they've stayed down. Um, so every four hours, we sw swap out the watch. Now, as you're looking here, you're saying, wow, that's a lot of people crammed in there. That's because it's a watch change. Right? So everybody who sits in that seat, they're kind of briefing everybody else. This was also one of the first dives um, for this new expedition. So you've got a lot of people here who are training newbies for the first time and are kind of sitting in. Um, so you see a lot of folks in there. So that takes us to my most recent expedition, uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. And we were set to explore a place called Davidson Seamount. Um, the OET, Ocean Exploration Trust, worked closely with the folks from the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary for over a year planning this particular expedition. Um, we were really excited to explore Davidson Seamount. It was only added to the sanctuary about eight, nine years ago, and they hadn't explored very deep. And so they were really excited that we were going to get to explore all of these sites, and pretty much the intention was we would dive as deep as we could at the base of the mountain, Seamount, and then work our way up with each dive as close as we could to the summit. And so um, very ambitious schedule probably about 200 hours of bottom time spread over two weeks. Um, nope. So our first dive was spectacular. 
and uh, I'm going to show you some photos from that. But uh, we had our first dive. We ran through all of our first um, watches for everybody on, you know, that um, had a watch. And then we were running back again through the second watch. I had a second watch. And I think I maybe even had a third watch, right? Went through the cycle a couple of times. I was exhausted. I'm like, okay, I have to go take a nap. I'm just dead on my feet. Went down, took a nap, came back up, and ran into one of my colleagues who was in my role. I said, what are you doing here? You're supposed to be on watch. Why are you not in the control van? She goes, we lost power to the vehicles. Oh, okay, well, what happened? I don't know, but tread lightly when you go up there. Everybody's in a really bad mood, okay? Um, so I kind of position myself outside of the expedition leader's um, cabin strategically, working on my laptop, trying to figure out what's going on without getting underfoot. And um, after a while, um, they get the vehicles on deck, the ROV team gets to work, trying to figure out what happened, and uh, then the ROV lead engineer comes in and I heard some expletives that will not be repeated um, come from the expedition leader's cabin and I went oh this isn't good so it turns out that, that one of the cables that actually connect the ROVs to the ship had failed and so we needed to cut out a big section of cable well we needed to find a facility that could help us take all of that cable off the winch under tension and then help us put it back on. We were in Monterey. The closest facility that could help us was down in Scripps, in San Diego. Yeah, so quickly we realized, okay, well, we're not gonna get the 200 hours of bottom time. Um, so let's just go down to Scripps, we'll get this dealt with, and then we'll come back up. Well, we did. It took us a couple of days, about three days total, um, to finally get there, get it dealt with, and start heading back up. By the time we came back up, weather had kicked up. So not only could we not dive as deep as we had planned for all of these dives, because now we were missing 1,500 meters of cable, um, but now the wind had kicked up. And so the sanctuary people identified a site, still within the sanctuary, kind of behind a headland that hopefully wasn't going to have as much weather. A place called Mill Creek Canyon, not very deep, looking like it was gonna be pretty silty. We weren't thrilled, but hey, we were gonna get in the water again, right? Nope. So we tried twice to uh, get in the water and uh, it just wasn't gonna happen. My screen doesn't wanna forward. Maybe it'll catch up to me. Um, so at that point, we faced a really tough decision because there was another leg to the expedition um, for the season coming up right behind us. And Ballard was gonna actually meet the ship in San Pedro and come out here to our own Channel Islands. And so we knew we had to be back at San Pedro so Ballard could get on board. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so as a result, oh, there we go, thank you, you got it. Um, so as a result, we decided, well, we could stay here, wait out the weather, maybe get nothing, or we can turn tail and head back down to the Channel Islands behind Point Conception where the wind will be less, and that's what we did. So we came down and squeaked in one more dive at Anacapa, which was great because I live down in Ventura, so I was kind of on deck going, I can see my house from here. <laughs> um, and it was really cool, again, to be in my backyard. As much as I wanted to be at Davidson um, and see the extraordinary stuff that's there, it just wasn't in the cards this year. Um, as it turns out, a lot of people really like to hear that story because they like to hear about the things that go wrong, right? So uh, people love to hear the stories of that trip. Um, this is where we were supposed to do a lot of our exploring, um, right about 70 miles, 75 miles off the coast of Monterey. Um, actually, it's actually off the coast near, closer to Cambria, uh, San Simeon, where this is lined up. Um, but it's part of that Monterey National Marine Sanctuary. So again, people wonder, okay, well, what did you see? So our photos here are a combination of stuff that we saw um, both in Davidson and Anacapa. Um, so these guys are actually called sea pigs um, because they have that pink color and those little chubby appendages. They're actually sea cucumbers, and they kind of crawl around on the seafloor and eat their way through the sediments. 
And then you can see there's a number of urchins here as well. People always ask us, do you find a lot of trash in the deep sea? And in fact, we do. And then the follow-up question is, well, do you pick it up? And no, we don't. There's a couple of reasons why. Um, first of all, any trash that we find, we geotag it in our system. So at least it's there, and there's a record of it. We found trash, and a description of it. But the reason why we don't pick it up is because that ROV needs to maintain enough buoyancy that if something goes wrong, it can go up to the surface. Right? So we can't overload it. We can only load up so many specimens, and that includes all of our biological specimens, all of our rocks and other geological specimens. So unfortunately, we just don't have the capacity to pick up the trash that we see. Um, but we do see quite a lot. People ask, well, what's the strangest thing that you found? Um, we have found a toilet. Um, we, off the coast of Catalina, we found a lot of unexploded ordnance. Um, and also off the coast of Catalina, uh, we found what looked like probably in the 70s or early 80s, someone chucked a bag of trash over the side because there was a whole pile of soda cans from about that era that were all together. You know, Hawaiian Punch, RC Cola, um, all in that, you know, 70, 80 kind of design and per perfectly intact. Right, so there is a lot of trash out there, not as much as you would see for as much alarm as we're hearing about trash on the surface and plastics. So down in the deep sea, we're not seeing a lot of that. So maybe it's breaking down or it's just not dense enough to settle that far, but we do see a lot of the heavier, denser stuff. So you may remember this. This was something that went viral. So this was on that first dive near Davidson Seamount. We found this Dumbo octopus. And this was incredible. This animal was about this big, right? This isn't a fish story. It wasn't this big. Now I've made it this big. No, it really was this big. Um, and hung out with us for a while. There is great video of this on the Nautilus Live website. Again, Dumbo octopus are fairly common in the deep sea, but our encounters with them are pretty rare, right? Because we're just not down there all that often. So as this thing is, is swimming around and we're all uh, like ooing and aahing over it, and I'm thinking, this is gonna go viral. Don't say anything stupid. Don't say anything stupid. Don't say anything stupid. And out of my mouth pops, I love me a good cephalopod. <laughs> and what do you know if that's what the media ran with? Um, so if you Google that um, and you hear that idiot on that video say that, that was me. Um, <laughs> I do love me a good cephalopod, though. I, just, I should make t-shirts. Um, and this was the cephalopod cruise. We saw so many octopus, like lots of them, really beautiful, really active. And then when I was taking that nap, right before we lost power to the vehicles, they came across something really unusual. They came across these fields of octopuses, and they were, seemed to all be kind of arranged in these rows these crags and the rocks. And they went, ah, oh, that's interesting. Let's follow this for a while. And so they started following it. And as they zoomed in, they realized, wow, they're all flipped upside down and putting their oral surface up to the top. What a bizarre thing. What are they doing? And then, again, you watch the video and you hear someone go, are they brooding? Oh, maybe they're brooding. And in fact, when they zoom in and they see one of the octopuses kind of move a tentacle, all of a sudden, you see all these white gleaming eggs underneath. And then in the video, you can also see the water is shimmering just a little bit. So it's warm water that was coming up from seeps in the rocks. And these mother octopuses were there brooding these eggs. So it was, and they found thousands of these animals. This had never been seen in this area, and the sanctuary people were ecstatic, right? Because they, they annexed this area onto the sanctuary not knowing what was there. Turns out they protected this octopus breeding site. How cool is that? So this went totally viral, it was absolutely amazing. And then as it turns out, you know, the world of ocean exploration is pretty small. So one of the uh, ROV pilots said, hey, I know a gal, I think maybe she was a former roommate or something, um, who did an expedition down in Costa Rica who saw something kind of similar to this. Let me get in touch with her. And turns out that, indeed, they had found something like this near Costa Rica a couple of years previous. Not so many octopus, 
but octopus from the same genus. And so then, of course, she sent her paper, and then all our scientists aboard the ship were kind of tearing into the paper and trying to find, going back over the video and trying to find similarities. Um, so again, this was a major discovery. And it was a, really cool to see something go viral again and, and hear all the calls come in from the press and people wanting to hear more about it. So this is actually from our final dive right here off of Anacapa. So it was Halloween was our final dive. And so we were really excited for our Nautilus Live Halloween edition. Our first special guest was a fang fish. And he actually hung out with us for quite a while, looking very creepy. We also saw quite a lot of rockfish. So if you're a fisherman, you're probably pretty familiar. We get a lot of rockfish. And um, we also saw a lot of these sponges. Like when I say we saw a lot, we saw a lot, a lot of sponges. And normally we'd be like, yeah, okay, sponges. But as it turns out, one of the people on our cruise was from Mbari, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and she's a sponge expert. And she is the cutest, smartest woman who got us all excited about sponges, if you can believe it. She would talk about sponges for hours on end during her watch, and we'd all be like, Amanda, tell us more about sponges. And she would, and it was great. And, and when I say we found a lot of sponges, we found a lot of sponges. Look at, there's Hercules. Now Hercules, remember, is about the size of a small SUV, right? And look at all of these sponges. Um, and in fact, they're also forming reefs, which she didn't know happened in this area. So that was another new discovery. So one of the things that I like to say is you go out with 100 questions and you come back with 1,000. Right? There's really good job security in this because no matter what you learn, you always realize that there's so much more to learn. So, alas, you come to the end. Now, if you're lucky, you get to do a night recovery. It's really beautiful. The light's kind of coming up through the water, getting brighter and brighter and brighter. All the night birds are all kind of, you know, swirling around trying to eat the squid that are attracted to the lights. And uh, it's really magical. And then once we get the vehicles up on deck, then the science team swings into action. They're recovering all of the specimens and samples that were taken during the dive. They take them up to the wet lab for processing. And in the wet lab, they then take all of those specimens, they prepare them. So if it's a geological specimen and it has living things on it, they'll actually um, photograph, measure, remove those living specimens. Living specimens get preserved in alcohol. Um, geological specimens go to the University of Rhode Island, and or uh, biological specimens go to the Harvard Institute of Comparative Zoology. And what's cool is these are open source. They're available to anybody who wants to go ahead and access these for study. So that's one thing that's super cool is that this science is available to everyone. It's not you know, this proprietary, like, it's mine, and you can't look at it. So that's one thing that I really love about it. One last thing that I want to share with you. So I talked about how ocean exploration, if you send people, is really inefficient. It's also really dangerous. So if you haven't read Dr. Ballard's books, I would totally recommend them, but I don't recommend them for bedtime reading. Because there's so many times that dude has almost died exploring the ocean, and uh, it's really dangerous. Um, and this is one of the reasons why, is water pressure. So for every 33 feet or about 10 meters that you descend in the ocean, the water pressure all around you, pressing from all sides, increases by 14 and a half pounds per square inch. Right? That's why your ears hurt when you dive deep in the pool. Right? So scientists love this, and they like to do this cute little thing, where they take coffee cups, and they decorate them with Sharpies, and then they send them down with the ROVs exposed to the water, and then it shrinks them. And that's great, right? You go, yay, I had a coffee cup, now I have a shot glass, woohoo, <laughs> right? Um, and that's fun, but I like to take things up a notch. So I took a pair of matching styrofoam heads in 2016, and I named them Pedro and Diego, because I got on the ship in San Diego and off in San Pedro. And I had all of my friends and colleagues. I was with the Girl Scouts at the time, so I had Girl Scouts also sign and decorate my styrofoam heads. And then I got aboard the ship, and 
Um, one of the ROV pilots said, well, you got to give them mohawks. <laughs> so he showed me how to do that with some nylon rope and a little tiny screwdriver. And then we held a social media contest. And we said, well, who's going to feel the pressure? Is it going to be Pedro or Diego? And we saved it till the very last dive of the season, which was that 3,300 meter dive, so nearly 11,000 feet. Um, turns out that Pedro won, or lost, depending on how you want to look at it. First, I want to introduce you to his brother, who either won or lost the contest, depending on how you want to look at it. This is Diego, right? Normal head size. You can see that he matches his brother identically. Well, I'd like to introduce you to Pedro, who got exposed to about 4,700 pounds per square inch of pressure. So if, so if anything illustrates, right, why ocean exploration is so dangerous in the deep sea, it's my friend Pedro. So I would love to thank you so much for listening to me ramble about this adventure, and I'd love to take any questions that you might have. question. Uh, so the question was, do we, right, do we rely upon visible light or do we use other wavelengths of light as well? Um, at this point, we just have visible light, um, very high powered light. I forget the lumens, um, but extremely high powered light. But nevertheless, like I said, you just get this tiny little puddle of light that you can see that extends for not very far. Yeah, and I think, it, so he said in that area where we showed the lava, it looked like you were able to get pretty wide. So you can see it extends a fair distance, but again, it fades pretty quickly. And it also fades pretty quickly depending on the, the um, clarity of the water, right? Because the more sediment that you have in there, you certainly don't want to stir that up with the thrusters from the ROV. So the ROV pilots are really careful when we get near the bottom um, because then that causes the light to scatter and really reduces your visibility. Yeah, good question. Yes. When you came across the lava that had been there previously, was there any interest in planting the source? Oh, good question. So she asked when we came across the lava near the Galapagos that hadn't been there previously, uh, whether there was interest in finding the source. Um, at that point, we didn't see anything that was a smoking gun, no pun intended. Um, for you know, that particular lava source. Sometimes, literally, it's just a crack opens up and the lava kind of comes out and paves the area. So it's not, it's not behaving like a volcano necessarily would behave here on the surface in that particular case. Um, but no, we did not find the source. And you know, my biggest thing during that particular expedition, I really wanted tube worms. I wanted tube worms so bad. I wanted to see them. That was my list. It was on my, my bucket list. I really wanted them. Our last dive that we had, we had technical problems. After Dr. Ballard had spent some time going, oh, I want to go look at this thing over here that's on the sonar. And so we were going to a place called Tempest Fugit, and we never made it there. And so I never got my tube worms. But then as I was still in the Galapagos at shore, I'm flipping through Facebook, and what do you know? I see everybody who's on the ship now lined up like seven of them holding this 14 foot long tube worm. They had just pulled up. So literally, I missed it by that much. Life lesson, right? Uh, any other questions? Yes. Good question. So the question is, how many other outfits like this are there? There's really not a lot. There's just a handful. Um, Okeanos Explorer 
also is very similar to what the Nautilus is doing in that um, it's broadcasting it live, you can hear it. I don't think you can send in questions and interact, have the two-way interaction with Okeanos, um, but both of those programs go through the University of Rhode Island at that Inner Space Center. Um, and I know that there's a handful of other programs like this, but really very, very few. It's incredibly expensive, it's really a niche market, and finding the funders who will help to support you with this is really difficult. Um, so, I mean, they say that less than 5% of the world's oceans have been explored in this kind of detail, right? I mean, we can say, oh, well, we've explored, you know, whatever percent people want to throw out there. But really getting down there and getting eyes on it and these high definition mapping, it's really a tiny, tiny fraction. More questions? Yes? What was the number before? <sighs> That's a good question. You know what, I, kn I know it, but I can't pull it out of my brain at the moment. Well, the, um, that A-frame that you see that's on the back, that's actually used to help lower uh, Argus into the water. So that was actually added, I believe, after the fact. Yeah. Um, I forget what, what her life was before. It's it, eluding me at the moment. I apologize. Yes. You know, I don't, oh, he asked if I have any um, comments about what's happening off of Spain. I'm actually not familiar with what's happening off of Spain. Um, is there a new plate that's, oh, right, there was a plate that there was slippage, right? Did I just see a headline about that? Yeah, the peeling of the plates. I saw that article, I did not read it. Um, I'm actually a biologist, I'm not a geologist. So um, going down and studying and seeing all the cool things that lava does under the ocean was, completely new experience for me. Um, and then just seeing those two plates, that was phenomenal. But yeah, I do need to read that article. Yes? That's an excellent question. We get that question a lot. So his question was, how does the change in pressure affect the animals that we pull up? Um, actually, you know, the, the bigger thing that affects animals other than pressure um, is the temperature change. Um, so um, some of the, most of the animals that we would pull up from the bottom actually don't exhibit a lot of change in pressure or a lot of symptoms because of the change in pressure. Um, but if you have a drastic temperature change, they really suffer. Um, so they found that they needed to really insulate those bio boxes after a couple of seasons to help keep them at that same temperature. Because especially if you're ascending for a couple of hours through different temperature water, that, that's a big change for them. Um, so that's, that's an excellent question. That's a really common one that we get a lot. Yes? That's a really good question. So the question, how did the animals respond to the light? Um, some are afraid of it. Some are repelled by it. Some are attracted to it. Um, people always want to know, well, are you hurting them? Right? Because these animals, they're not used to anything. And now all of a sudden, you're blasting them with this really bright light. And so we do see that a lot of animals have an aversion to it and move away from it. We're not sure if it's an aversion just to the light or if it's also because of all the sound, because the ROVs are really noisy. So it could be both. So on this last expedition, we actually partnered with Nat Geo and had a drop cam that was dropped off in certain places. And so it would sink to the bottom and it had a little bait package to attract animals. And then about every 15 minutes, it would light up and flash some pictures and then go back to sleep. With the idea being that it was away from our activity and we could maybe see things that we weren't seeing. Um, turns out we mostly saw stuff we were seeing in other places, deep sea fish, grenadiers and cusk eels and things like that. Um, so it's a great new technology that I think will get used a lot more. It's probably not producing any kind of permanent damage for these animals, um, but indeed I can imagine if you have never seen light and then all of a sudden that's in your eyes, kind of like when I stepped up here tonight, right, and that's all you see, right, then it could make them more, more vulnerable to predation or something temporarily until, you know, they're not blinded anymore. Um, but yeah, we, get, we do get that one question a lot too. Yes? Can the catfish produce an endless supply of flies and <laughs> Uh, so the, the question, those hagfish, can they produce a lot of slime over and over and over again? I believe so. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm sure that there's been some, some experiments to see how much can they you know, keep poking, poke them again. 
He'll come again. But I, I don't know. <laughs> Good question, though. Did it lock off the car? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any last questions? Oh, one more. You strictly use the Vulcan scan sonar to map the bomb, or you use side scan sonar to get more detail? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we use side scan sonar on, there's actually, uh, on some of the expedition legs, they actually have another vehicle a drone vehicle that they will send out with side scan sonar. Um, so here in the Channel Islands, most recently, Dr. Ballard has been looking for evidence of um, sea caves that would have been at level during the last glacial minimum um, to try and help prove that idea that humans didn't just come over the Bering Land Bridge, that they came down through the coastal routes as well. Um, and so the idea being that if they can find these sea caves that would have been at sea level, if they can find evidence of humans in those sea caves, then that could help to provide some of that evidence. And so in places where the ship couldn't get in, they actually had a drone that went in and used that side scan sonar to map some of those areas. I, I'm happy to stick around. I don't, okay, one, one last question. Okay, one last question. Oh, thank you. You know, I would go every year if I could. Um, this program is super competitive, but again, if you know, oh, she asked, when am I going again? I forgot to repeat the question. Um, and so I would go every year if I could. But uh, this program, by the way, is for formal and informal educators. So if you know any teachers or people in an informal education setting, they can apply for this fellowship um, through the Ocean Exploration Trust website. Um, and so every year they take maybe 15 to 17 people total, and I've gotten to go three times. Um, normally they only take you twice. So I didn't get to go this year, much to my chagrin. Um, but, you know, you've got to give someone else a chance. So I just told them I'm going to keep throwing an application at you guys every year because I want to go back. You know, it's, it's addictive. So um, I don't know. Hopefully I'll get to go again. And trust me, if I go, everyone's going to hear about it. <laughs> Well, again, thank you all so much. <laughs>